Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to the new session in uh, Puzzle Track. And in this session, uh, Sanjeev, uh, the creator of uh, Puzzle Functions, is going to share uh, the deployment options of Puzzle Functions. And uh, Sanjeev, um, it's your stage. Sounds good. Let me share my screen first. I'll start the things. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Um, I'm assuming that's that's yes. Hey folks, uh, I'm Sanjeev. Um, you know, me and CJ worked in our previous incarnation at Streamlio. I'm one of the I was one of the co-founders and CTO of Streamlio, where we uh, advanced Pulsar. Um, and today, uh, you know, I'm going to be presenting you about Pulsar functions. Uh, currently, I work at Splunk. I'm part of the data stream processing uh, uh, engine um, over there. But more on that a little bit later. So without further ado, uh, let's let's get going. Right. Um, here's a brief agenda um, of the talk. Um, you know, just giving a brief introduction of Pulsar functions. Probably, hopefully, most of the people will already know this. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the life cycle management. Like, what does function life cycle actually means and stuff like that. And then we'll go into the meat of uh, the talk, which is the various deployment options are uh, present. In particular, uh, we'll grow. Uh, in the threaded model, uh, I call that the flink, uh, flink model of running operators uh, and functions as threads. Then we'll go uh, into the process model, I call that as heron model, wherein we'll run the operators as processes. And then the cloud native model, which is increasingly becoming more and more common, which is you know usually uh, in, in, in a Kubernetes uh, kind of an environment. And if time permits, at the end, I'll try to touch base on something equivalent called state store that Pulsar Functions has, um, and so on and so forth. So just briefly introducing functions. I think this is hopefully something that I'm already familiar with. Uh, Pulsar Functions bring serverless concepts into the streaming world, um, right? Like, so the idea is that you give a function f, and this function is executed on um, every message of one or more incoming uh, you know, topics. So every time a message arrives in on the message bus, you invoke this function. Um, and the, uh, the sole goal, uh, and, and the, you know, the function has an output, and the output goes to an output topic. So you can sort of think about functions as bridging uh, a gap between an input and an output topic, uh, right? And the unique thing about Pulsar functions is that we do stateful processing. And I'll touch more upon the stateful aspects of these things a little bit later. Um, the emphasis, as in serverless world, is on simplicity, right? Like, we want Pulsar functions to be used by anyone without having, uh, without having to actually go and learn about any new complicated SDK and so on and so forth. So for instance, if you are on in Java, and you're writing a Java function, you just need to know uh, the Java SDK and not really any Pulsar SDK, uh, Pulsar Functions SDK. So, you know, Java Util function is something that's present in any Java SDK. You can just uh, write a function based on that, and boom, you're ready to actually deploy this function on a Pulsar cluster. So it's really great to, uh, you know, get someone quickly started, um, you know, uh, and be productive on day one. Uh, and you know the and the idea also is that it's it's meant more for the ninety percent of the use cases, right? Like most of the use cases, and you know this is coming from a background of Twitter and a bunch of other places that we sort of worked in. Most of the tasks are uh, a routine task of filtering, data routing, data enrichment, and so on and so forth. A bunch of which can be achieved using functions. Of course, we are not saying that we solve all of the data processing problems. So there is a role for Spark and Flink and other heavyweight uh, stream processing, more complete stream processing systems. So functions is not really meant to be a replacement for that, but it's more like a complementary, uh, you know, to 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 something like a Spark or a Flink. Um, with that out of the way, you know, let's let's lead into you know the Pulsar functions life cycle. So you know, at its core. The, the functions are managed by something called as workers, 
And, and these workers essentially are, you know, expose a CRUD-based REST API. So just like topics in Pulsar, our functions are also, you know, equivalent of resources. So you can create a, a function, you can update a function, you can even delete the function and, and, and you know, view the function and so on and so forth. So that's a series of, you know, REST API calls, you know, that the workers uh, expose. Right. And the workers also do various all sorts of other things like, you know, they, they have a window into uh, the function. So you can do things like get the stats. How many uh, how many tuples has this functions uh, executed and so on and so forth? How many functions are there on this particular namespace? You know, so on the usual uh, admin related work you can do, uh, you know, using these uh, these workers. And you know the the whole idea of this worker cluster is that they are supposed to take care of all the resiliency aspects of things. So if nodes fail, uh, if processes or or functions fail, uh, they are supposed to restart them. Uh, they are supposed to recover from the failures and ensure that a set of functions is running all the time. The cluster is always sort of in a healthy state, right? And in terms of lifecycle management, we really have two flavors out here. One is what we call as pulsar managed. That is, the Pulsar framework itself takes care of the life cycle of the functions. And increasingly, what's sort of becoming common is an externally managed systems like Kubernetes. So you, you can sort of thinking about using Kubernetes primitives to define a function, launch it inside a Kubernetes function, uh, in, inside a Kubernetes cluster, and let Kubernetes deal about the heavyweight stuff, about uh, monitoring, about, uh, excuse me, uh, monitoring about um, yeah um, about resource allocations and so on and so forth all right um, and you know we need to just provide a window so that the same functions that can be run using pulsar managed environments can actually run in a kubernetes managed uh, environment as well um, so I talked about workers and I, you know I talked about pulsar managed uh, clusters so what does a pulsar managed cluster actually mean right um, in this in this diagram, you see you know a bunch of um, workers, and you know in this you know you saw you see three worker three worker nodes basically. One of them, the the one in the blue, is identified a leader, right? So in a pulsar managed uh, you know life cycle, uh, functions lifecycle management, uh, there is a series there is a set of uh, uh, nodes called as the worker nodes, and the framework takes care of electing one of these worker nodes as leader. Um, and in this case, the blue one identifies that leader. Um, and the, the leader essentially is keeping track of all of the functions and the in instances where they are running and so on and so forth, and making sure that they're all scheduled, uh, making sure that new functions are being scheduled in, in the right places, making sure that old workers are removed from their scheduling slots and so on and so forth. So essentially, if you're familiar with you know, uh, Flink uh, slots, um, you know, uh, and, and the and the Flink uh, manager doing this work. Essentially, the leader um, is is doing that. And then, and then like Flink, any one of the worker can become a leader. And you know, there is a leader election. It happens via Zookeeper, which is not shown in this figure. But essentially, a whole set of orchestration happens behind the scenes to ensure that there's only one single leader at any point of time, and the leader ensures uh, the the leader essentially takes care of all the scheduling aspects. Um, you know of, of these functions, and as you can see in the, in this particular uh, uh, cluster of three, there are three functions. Um, there is um, there is you know uh, function one, function two, function three, and each of these functions can have many different instances, so called the sharding factor or parallelism, as it's called in the in the functions uh, function world. So you can sort of see that there is a certain amount of distribution that the leader has done uh, in this particular thing. So you know the the worker on the left is running two instances. The leader himself can actually run many instances. In this case, he's running three, and the worker on the right is running you know two instances of the of the functions. And so this is all about, you know, this is what I mean by saying this whole orchestration is managed by Pulsar, right? So if you have a new function, hey, function four, you know, it's it's a it's a it's the function of the leader to ensure that function four is scheduled on one of the nodes. Um, and in this case, let's just say you know the leader chooses work worker four, or the the work on the left to basically run this function, and the function basically starts up there, and so on and so forth, um, right? Um, and the framework also takes care of function failures. 
you know, so for instance, what happens when function four dies for whatever reason? Um, you know, there could be a lot of exceptions that are thrown in the functions and so on and so forth. So it's up to the monitoring inside uh, inside the Pulsar framework to ensure that this function is actually restarted and you know it is either scheduled in the same node or maybe in other nodes if it keeps on uh, restarting on one particular uh, node and so on and so forth. Right. What happens when machines go down, right? Like, you know, when the worker on the left vanishes, we need to ensure that all of the function instances that have been assigned to that particular worker are redistributed to other, uh, you know, existing and, and healthy uh, workers. And again, this is you know, the work of the leader that you know, ensures that, you know, that, that sort of happens. You know, you can also say, you know, what happens when the leader himself, uh, you know, itself goes down. And again, you know, it's this whole leader election that happens orchestrated with the help of Zookeeper that then maintains, uh, you know, that then elects a new leader. And this new leader now takes care of scheduling and ensuring that every of the functions um, that have been submitted are um, are running. So that's what essentially what I mean by a Pulsar managed resiliency and a Pulsar managed um, function uh, life cycle. Um, and, and, and when we talk about externally managed, um, uh, uh, life cycle management, and that's really, you are now instead of Pulsar managing, uh, you know, the instances of the functions and so on and so forth, what Pulsar is doing, and typically there is only one or two, maybe uh, Pulsar worker nodes in that point is they're actually just creating uh, a job definition in, in, in whatever the externally managed uh, environment there is, right? And the most popular one these days seems to be Kubernetes. So in this case, what has done is that when you submit a Pulsar function, function one, um, uh, the, the, the function frameworks uh, creates a job template out of it and submits that to the configured Kubernetes cluster. And, and therefore, from a Pulsar functions point of view, all it is doing is maintaining a pointer to that job, uh, right? Just you know, some sort of a job handle or, or something like that, so that it can manipulate the job as and when you sort of request it from, um, you know, from the Pulsar uh, functions, uh, you know, API, right? So in this case, you know, the same three functions um, that we sort of uh, viewed in the last diagram are now uh, defined as three different Kubernetes jobs. And they're running, th these are actually run by the Kubernetes cluster, right? Pulsar has no role here in scheduling these jobs and ensuring that they are uh, rightfully uh, uh, running in the right uh, requested replicas and so on and so forth. All of that heavyweight or orchestration is done by the Kubernetes layer, right? And Kubernetes layer also does isolation and stuff like that, right? Like ensuring that, you know, each of these instances take only say a gigabyte of RAM and, you know, uh, two CPUs and so on and so forth. All of that orchestration happens in the Kubernetes layer. All we are doing is converting uh, a function into a service pack and then you know uh, making sure that that sorts of runs in, in the Kubernetes and just managing a, a job handle essentially uh, for that particular Kubernetes uh, Kubernetes job. Uh, so we, we, with 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 those uh, lifecycle management and the differences between uh, Pulsar managed versus externally managed, let's actually go into the kind of the deployment models um, that are sort of out there. And this is not going to be an exhaustive deployment model as you know, one of the things that we sort of designed Pulsar functions was to have this real flexibility in terms of deploying. So I'm going to cover just three of them that I outlined at, at the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the talk. When we when we talk about the function workers, what actually what actually is uh, inside the function workers, right? So I'm just looking at a particular worker, one of those workers that we sort of uh, saw in the previous slides. So this is a worker that's running uh, two functions. You know, fun, you know, it's running the instance zero of function three and instance one of function one, right? Uh, this probably is not the leader because it's not blue, but it doesn't really matter. All we're trying to do is peel in, into what this uh, worker actually composed of. And, and inside the workers, among many components, there is something called as a runtime manager. And it's the runtime manager that is actually responsible for spawning 
uh, each of these functions. So in this case, you know, there is a there is a uh, there is something called as a spawner that actually the runtime manager uses to uh, to basically create these functions. So in this case, you can sort of see there is F1 and F2 that are spawned by this particular workers, um, and uh, you know, uh, so what you can then sort of think about is that if we configure the spawner, we can then basically run these functions in any manner we want, right? So we can we can think about this uh, spawner uh, spawning threads if you want to run functions as threads, right? Or as processes if you want to run functions as processes. So it's 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 essentially at the heart of the things you are configuring something inside the worker node, something inside the spawner to say, hey, when functions come to you, you know. You know, just run them as threads or run them as processes or run them as your own fancy things like, you know, Docker and so on and so forth, which we don't support out of the box, but, you know, which support something that can easily be add, added, uh, you know, uh, you know, inside inside the code. Right. Um, so let, let's see in this sort of a thing, what really happens when when I talk, when we say run as functions, run as threads. Right. So so we saw this worker node. And inside this worker node uh, is, is a worker process uh, running, right? And the worker process has a bunch of internal components, which I sort of call as, quote unquote, the framework. Um, and this framework essentially also spawns these two uh, functions, F1 and F2, as individual threads. Right. So in this particular example, this is a worker node. Uh, it runs two functions, uh, F1 and F2, and these could be like you know two instances of a function or something like that. Right. Like, um, and they are run as separate threads inside the worker um, worker process. And um, now running it this way has a lot of consequences, and and a lot of consequences that I'm sort of going to come back a little bit later. But if you look at what a worker cluster would look like in this configuration, we could see that the worker cl uh, cluster is nothing but a series of workers, each running their own assigned instances of functions as threads, right? So in this cluster, there are two uh, worker nodes, worker one and worker two, and they're each running two threads, uh, right? This is essentially the same diagram that, is, uh, that you saw a few slides ago, um, except that you know we've sort of highlighted F1 and F2 being run as threads um uh, you know in you know and if you sort of zoom out even further right this is how the entire cluster looks like right like this is your worker cluster on your left composed of worker one and worker two and on the right is your quote unquote the pulsar the message queue you know the pub sub cluster you know represented by broker one and uh, broker two Right. So I want to basically highlight this saying that these two notionally are different clusters. Right. It's definitely possible to run them as the same. Right. Like we can sort of collapse both of them and run it this way. And, and what essentially I'm showing in this function, in this diagram, is that there is a two node cluster, node one and node two, each one of them running both the worker and the functions and the broker inside one single process, inside one single JVM, um, quote unquote, um, right? So, you know, like the, the obvious question is, hey, what are the real consequences of doing this, right? Like, you know, you're right. The fact that if we run it this way, you know, there are obvious consequences, right? In the sense that, look, you're running all your compute along with your uh, you know pub sub message queue uh, work that's going on right and if you run you know really random user code who knows what the user code uh, can do in particular the user code being running the same function has actually access to the entire address space of brokers and so on and so forth so they can do pretty nasty things right but there are again all of these deployment options have a particular use case in mind the one great advantage of going it this way is the fact that we can now run this in an extremely low footprint, 
right? Imagine running your message queue and your computation, all of them rolled over as one single process, right? This is a very extremely low footprint that you can probably cram inside an IoT agent running, running in some embedded system somewhere with just maybe a few hundred megabytes of RAM uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? In, in those kind of a scenarios, this sort of a deployment model makes absolute uh, you know, absolute sense. Yes, you have a few caveats, but assuming that you've handwritten these functions and you know what these functions are actually doing, this sort of a development and deployment model is possible, the Pulsar functions. It, they come with consequences, but they also have some nice features. But as I really hopped on, you don't need to do that, right? Like it's it's not necessary that functions need to run with the brokers. You can per, it's perfectly possible to have a bunch of brokers running on different nodes and a bunch of workers running on totally different nodes, so that we have this clean separation between the function processing and the message queue and all the other uh, things that you are doing. Uh, right. So, you know, you really want to have this uh, compute and messaging separation. When you, when you want to like, among other things, you can scale things independently. So you, you, you're adding a lot of functions while your, your number of streams, et cetera, remains constant. That's fine. You just increase the number of workers instead of two workers. Now you'll have 10 workers or whatever based on, you know, what your, uh, what your requirements are. On the other hand, if you're if your message brokers are the ones which are now uh, taking on more data and, and serving more needs, you can then independently scale your brokers, right? So they, you know, one of the hallmarks of Pulsar has always been the separation of different things, right? The basic concept that Pulsar pioneered was the separation of storage and the separation of uh, the serving. Here, we are essentially carrying over the same philosophy and saying, you know what, you can actually now separate out the compute part of it as well. You can combine it if you want, as we saw it in previous slides, in use cases where that makes sense. However, in a more generic sense, you can actually separate them out so that you can run them separately, manage them separately, scale them separately, and so on and so forth. By the way, um, because functions are still running as threads, um, they can still access the frameworks at a space and they can still sort of mess around with each other in some uh, in, in more direct manner. So, you know, running as threads, even in this kind of an environment where, uh, you know, the, the, the processing is separate from the brokers and so on and so forth, still has the same set of issues of noisy neighbor uh, that you occasionally see in, in you know, like Flink and, and Spark and, 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 and stuff like that, right? Like that, that um, those kind of issues of noisy neighbors and stuff like that um, do exist when you're running. And that's the definition of running as threats, like, like you, want, you want a little bit of flexibility in terms of reduced, you know, JVM uh, startup costs and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you sort of um, trade off that with, you know, noisy neighbors and, and stuff like that. So it really sort of depends on what kind of use cases you have and what's acceptable to you to this particular use case and scenario and what's not. Um, now, coming back, um, well, you know, as we sort of saw in the beginning, it's it's not just uh, it's not just processing as threads. We can also do processing as uh, you know as uh, processes, run functions as processes. Uh, I call that the Heron model because you know in Heron at Twitter we did essentially the same thing of converting all the operators as processing as as separate processes to sort of minimize their uh, uh, noisy neighbor issues, which are which are plaguing a lot of our topologies at, uh, inside Twitter. Um, but essentially, going back to the same diagram. What we basically have here is that inside a worker node, you have this worker process. And the worker process composes of a bunch of these framework things, but when they actually launch the functions, uh, these functions are running as separate processes. So F1 and F2 here are two separate uh, 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 processes uh, that are running alongside the worker process in this particular um, worker node. 
right? And if you basically sort of expand that out again using the same uh, philosophy as we sort of saw in the threads, you know, a, a, a series of workers set up this way becomes your worker cluster. And each of these worker clusters will run their functions um, sort of, you know, as, as processes. So in this case, there are two workers, worker one and worker two, each running uh, two instances of functions as individual processes inside each one of them. By the way, the same set of rules apply, right? This is a further um, enhanced view wherein you're seeing the processing cluster different from your pub sub slash messaging uh, cluster. So you have the processing worker one, worker two cluster on the left and broker one, broker two, your pub sub cluster is on the right. They're completely separated out and so on and so forth. Now, just as before, you can run them concurrently within each other in the sense that you can sort of think about the framework and the broker uh, being part of one process and the functions running as separate processes in, in the worker. So in this case, you know, you can, as you can sort of see, the broker represented with the deep purple uh, and, and the workers in, uh, represented with the framework are running inside one process, right? But the, but the, but the function, uh, functions that we are spawning are themselves individual processes. So, so F1, F2, and similarly F3 and F4 are their own uh, processes, right? Um, it, it, it kind of allows a, a little bit of isolation between the functions in the sense that now functions do not have access to the address space of each other or address space of the framework or the address space of the broker, right? So it's 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 a lot more uh, isolation. And in several languages like JVM, and so on and so forth, you actually control the footprint, the RAM footprint um, of, of these functions. So you, you, you necessarily have more control now uh, but you know it comes at a at a cost, right? Like processes are obviously more heavyweight OS structures compared to threads, and therefore you pay a little more extra price for the uh, better isolation. Again, it depends on what you really um, want, uh, what your uh, use case scenario uh, is, right? Um, now. This use case scenario might be good if you have a uh, you know bunch of uh, you know connectors, right? These connectors typically uh, you know you know what uh, what these connectors are doing. They're generally fetching things. You probably have written their connectors yourself or taking some well-known open source uh, connector definitions that are out there. So you kind of control what code is running inside these functions, right? So in that mode, you can sort of run these functions as, as processes. They, they won't interfere with each other in terms of, you know, their library clashes and stuff like that. So they kind of run nicely with each other. Um, and, and at the same time, uh, you know, you don't really need to have another uh, cluster to sort of manage, right? So the manageability is you now just have one cluster, one Pulsar cluster that comprises of both uh, message queue and the worker. So it's a lot less manageability from the managing uh, operation, operating uh, uh, point of view, right? But again, you can run it them separately as well, right? Like the same uh, philosophy uh, kind of applies when here, like, you know, you're, you're having your own processing cluster as defined by worker one and worker two, your own pops up brokering clusters, uh, you know, in broker one and broker two, right? And, 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 and again, you know, you can do this separation if you want to, you can scale them independently, you can manage them independently and, and, and so on. So, so all the basic uh, niceties that sort of apply with, uh, with the threading running separately, you can sort of think about how they apply to this functions running, uh, you know, uh, separately from the broker cluster um, uh, as well, uh, right? Um, now, what has become uh, more prevalent in the last few years has been this movement to the Kubernetes world. And, and you know, I touched, I sort of touched upon this uh, uh, briefly a few minutes ago. Um, Kubernetes is this framework where, uh, you know, it takes care of pretty much everything, right? Like it takes care about how you run, what sort of resources that they have in a more controlled and a nice uh, manner, uh, right? And it's increasingly being adopted by different companies to be the single resource manager, 
uh, right? Like one of the one of the issues with having multiple resource managers, like let's just say you have your pub sub running in a cluster, your workers running in a cluster, and so on and so forth, right? And each one of these resource managers sort of tend to deal with resources in a different abstract manner. For instance, Flink has its concept called the task slots, where task slots is you know, proportional to the amount of uh, memory that that the particular machine has. Uh, you can sort of think about similar concept existing in other things like even fun uh, managed functions inside pulsars and so on and so forth, right? Um, now, they, since they are all different from each other, it sort of becomes very difficult to manage an unwieldy bunch of different uh, concepts inside one physical cluster that one may possess, right? So Kubernetes is supposed to be the one that solves it all in the sense that there's only one resource manager, one way of sort of managing how jobs are done, how jobs are isolated from each other, what are the guarantees that a particular jobs have, and one way of sort of deploying and running uh, and monitoring these uh, these jobs. So to sort of extend that, what we basically did was, you know, instead of actually pulsar managing these jobs, you, you sort of think about, you know, these jobs being managed externally. And the framework just is holding a copy, a uh, job ID, essentially, of these of these. Um, uh, Kubernetes jobs. Um, so what it basically allows is that you know the, everything is managed at the Kubernetes layer of you know how resource isolation is done, how how the cluster is provisions and so on and so forth. At that point of time, uh, the the pulse are uh, the worker process just merely becomes an API gateway of some sort to admit uh, to like create functions, delete functions, and so on and so forth. Uh, the actual running is done inside the Kubernetes uh, layers. Um, now we talked about, uh, we talked about, uh, processes and threads, uh, but another, uh, uh, interesting thing is that the way in which the, the Pulsar code is structured, it's actually pretty straightforward to add some other, uh, runtime constructs. Like for instance, if you want to run your, pro your uh, functions as Docker instances inside your worker nodes, uh, again, Docker instances managed by the Pulsar uh, cluster, by, by Pulsar, you can easily extend that. Uh, right, the the entire Pulsar framework is written with a plugin architecture uh, in mind, wherein we can quickly configure these to uh, basically either use processes or threads or Docker's as your spawning mechanism, and the system will automatically take care of things. Right, so it's e very easy for developers to basically write something like, you know, I want pro I want functions to be spawned as Docker containers, and again, Docker containers come with their own. Um, you know, nice properties like, you know, you can really isolate, uh, you know, CPU and RAM uh, both effectively um, and so on and so forth. It's a little, it's a lot more tighter isolation model. Again, it it, ha it comes with its own, you know, it, it's a little more heavier weight compared to just one single process and a lot more heavyweight than say compared to a thread and so on and so forth. Again, you choose, there is, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a slider here basically. And the slider is the more complexity, the more heavyweight the nature is, the better isolation that you get. But you have the control as, as a user, you can actually control between what kind of isolation uh, you want and, and, and therefore what is the price that you're going to pay to get those isolation um, features. Um, um, so one of the things that we often talk about obliquely inside any function deployments and, and sort of not really address is the concept of the state store. Um, you know, at the beginning of the talk, I, I referred to functions, pulsar functions as stateful processing, right? Like what does stateful processing actually mean, right? You know, as you can sort of gather, like functions can have a uh, state in them. Like, you know, let's just say I'm counting the words. So number of times I've seen the word uh, foo is, is a state that I need to hold, right? Like I can definitely have another system, let's just say Redis or, or Cassandra or, or some other key value store to sort of store this data and so on and so forth. Right, but that's yet another system that you have to manage. You have to set up. You have to administer, and so on and so forth. Right. So one of the things that we've sort of done is for these sort of simple use cases, we have rolled our own simple, uh, uh, you know, key value store inside uh, inside uh, Pulsar itself, and that is the one that actually provides a key value store API and is the one that's used for functions to sort of store the state. So the functions, uh, you know, will have things like, hey, you know, store this a particular state from this particular function. And then when I come back, let's just say on failures, I can get that 
a particular state. I can see where I was. I can then sort of uh, uh, keep on going, right? Um, it has some nice properties. This this KV store is is geared towards keeping function states. So it has some nice properties as first class support for gauges, counters, and a bunch of other usual suspects that you are usually measuring inside um, inside functions. Um, and at the end of the day, it's it's just a gRPC service. It actually uses bookies uh, as its right ahead logs and uses RocksDB for its uh, local index, right? Like um, typically, the way uh, you know this is deployed is that the state store is actually just part of the bookie node itself. Right now, uh, if you're familiar, Pulsar is a two-stage two architecture, brokers and bookies. Uh, and in this case, what happens is that when when a function F2 wants to make any state service call, uh, essentially, hey, I want to store this, and or I want to I want to get this particular uh, value, of, uh, get this particular value of this particular key. It connects to what's called the state store, and state store is re usually residing in the, in this bookie node. So in this configuration, as I, I've shown in this diagram, there's a bookie node that does the regular bookie stuff all the IO handling and so on and so forth but in addition it has a uh, it has a sort of a state store right like if you sort of double click a little bit on this uh, you know just the the uh, bookie node and you know just go into the state store uh, at the end of the day it's it's a grpc service right it runs a table service and the table service uses bookie so as and when updates are coming into the state store say functions are saying hey update this value update this value it's actually using bookies as a right head log right it uses fast bookies to like just write this doc, uh, thing down and so on and so forth and in the background, it's using rocks DB uh, to maintain this index so that when someone is actually saying a get, it's able to sort of fetch it fast and, and give that uh, data back to you. Uh, the actual uh, definition and uh, and the design constructs and the trade-offs and uh, stuff like that that uh, we did for state store is probably part of another uh, talk in itself. But if you sort of look at the deployment uh, sort of stuff that we are concerned here, right? One typically finds that you know state store being deployed inside bookies, you have this clusters wherein you have this bookie cluster and the state store essentially becomes the state store uh, cluster of its own. Um, so in this case, there are two bookies and therefore there are two replicas of state stores running inside those, uh, uh, inside those bookies. But the key construct, again, extending the philosophy of Pulsar that everything can be sort of separated out in its components, state store can be run separately, can be deployed separately from the bookies itself. So in, in, in this diagram, we have this bookie cluster on your right, which just do the handling of the data and so on and so forth, right? On the other hand, the gRPC service and all the table service is running with the state store. That's managed separately. That's run separately in, in its own cluster, um, right? And obviously, you know, the, the same niceties um, that you sort of see with, um, you know, with, with all of the other components being some separately is that uh, now you reduce your blast radius in the sense that if something happens to bookies, it doesn't affect the state store. If something happens to state store, it doesn't affect the bookies. You can scale them and manage them independently of each other. Um, you know, so if you're you, typically uh, the, the state associated with functions really depend on the use case of the of the functions. Some of the functions have really a lot of state and others really have no state. So depending on your particular use case, you can actually extend, uh, you can scale uh, state store independently of your uh, sort of the uh, bookie data. You can administer uh, it independently of your uh, of your uh, book, bookie uh, uh, data, right? Um, but net net, uh, the the uh, the sort of the TLDR version that I want to basically go is that look, it's um, you know, the the main things that functions offers is that it's a very simple API that allows stateful processing and so on and so forth, and it also is very very flexible from a deployment perspective. Um, right, and you can run them as threads, run them as processes, run them as Kubernetes, and you can scale them separately if you want. And and that's really the sort of the beauty 
of, of pulsar functions, right? Like you're not tied to just one model and therefore one inflexibility of, uh, compared to that model. You can basically uh, mix and match according to the use cases. You can take it as low as possible with the head model and, and deploy it in a in a few hundred megabytes, uh, you know, IoT box, and you can sort of scale it uh, in a large cluster and sort of manage and scale independently. Um, that is all my talk. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll stop the screen sharing. And uh, thanks, Sanjeev, for the presentation. Uh, if if you have any questions, just you can type the question in the chat. Uh, actually, I have a question for, for Sanjeev. Uh, so, uh, you mentioned uh, you, you kind of like uh, having a uh, have a great way on mapping uh, like the the thread model, process model, in Kubernetes uh, Kubernetes model, kind of mapping that, uh, comparing that with, with Flink and Storm. And what do you think, like uh, in terms of like from low map perspective, that how pulsar function is going to evolve and uh, up uh, is puzzle functions going to focus more on the integrate integrations with uh, Kubernetes or not? Uh, yeah, so that that's a good question. So the the question more is, where is pulsar functions headed? Um, um, and I'm going I'm, maybe I'll try to address that both in deployment model perspective. Um, as well as you know general pulsar functions perspective, right? Like um, there is a lot of work going on in pulsar functions uh, to basically enhance the scalability, um, right? Like this is something that I, I touched base in my previous talk um, at Pulsar Summit, uh, wherein there is uh, there, are, there are few places where we are seeing that you know when we have millions of instances of functions uh, a submission process deletion process etc you know that sorts of becomes sort of a bottleneck and so on and so forth so we are we are basically doing a lot of work to um, uh, you know to make sure that those uh, those things scale up uh, uh, nicely uh, some of the other things that we are sort of doing is with respect to um, languages supported by pulsar functions which is you know right now we have great support for java and and you know good support for python and and go um you know but uh you know like i believe that you know as usual typically it's java which gets all the latest and greatest features um python and and go are kind of the stepchilds wherein they they sort of get the, the features sort of get added as and when requested basis and so on and so forth. But that's probably something that that probably is going to be improving in, in the in the coming thing. Uh, with respect to deployment itself, uh, one of the big project, one of the big things that I, you know that I think we are doing is the is the Kubernetes integration story, right? Like it's sort of becoming increasingly clear that Kubernetes is the deployment choice of the future for. Um, for not just Pulsar, but everything that uh, an enterprise has, uh, that's certainly true inside, inside Splunk. And one of the things with Kubernetes is that uh, it has a language, like it has service constructs for things like secret stores and stuff like that, which I didn't really touch base uh, with in this particular talk, but is very, very critical if you're storing critical pieces of credential kind of information that you uh, want to sort of keep it secretly, but want to have functions access it and so on and so forth. There is some uh, great deal of integration work being done to integrate Kubernetes native uh, secret stores with with uh, with functions and and so on and so forth. So in general, there is a, there is a lot of efforts happening on multiple different directions. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for kind of other explanation. Uh, if you still have any questions, then you want to uh, touch base with Sanjeev. Uh, you can find Sanjeev in uh, Pulsar Stack channel. Uh, you should be able to find the information in Pulsar website on how how to join the uh, Pulsar Stack channel. And uh, thank uh, Sanjeev. Thank you for your presentation. And that will be uh, that's all for this session. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Being here.